Well, thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar, Epidemic of Chronic Disease, Infinite Causes with Finite Disease Expressions. I'm Greg Berry, Director of Communications in the Office of Alumni Affairs. Since this is a virtual event, please excuse technical issues or glitches that may pop up. If you have problems with video or audio, click the reconnect button on your screen to get back to the webinar quickly. Just a note, we are recording tonight's webinar. A replay will be made available on our website tomorrow. Tonight, we are well, uh, excited to welcome Dr. Greg Natello. Dr. Natello is a Cleveland Clinic and UAB educated internist and cardiologist. He completed his fellowship here in 1989 at UAB. Through his journey as a physician, a patient, he's moved from placing stints in arteries to getting to the root causes that drive today's epidemic of chronic disease. And Dr. Natello, I'll tell you, you scared me to death because you dropped your video and you came back in. So thank you so much. At this time, I would love to formally welcome you to the webinar series and turn things over to you. And for our audience, we do have three polls. So as they pop up throughout the presentation, go ahead and just slip in your answers. Um, there'll be multiple choice and, and we'll have fun as, as we go along. So Dr. Natello, it's, it's all yours. Thank you, Greg. I really appreciate it. And thanks for great work. And um, we did have one misstep uh, as I start here. Uh, we uh, were going to give away Super Bowl tickets and UAB agreed to that. And then when I asked for the tickets tonight, he said, oh, the Super Bowl was last week. So we don't have the Super Bowl tickets, maybe next year, Greg. But anyway, uh, yeah, this, uh, this talk is actually about love. It's uh, National Heart Month and uh, Valentine's week, this is about love. Um, and give yourself the greatest gift, which is health for yourself and those you care about. And the talk really focuses on things that help shape us throughout our lifetime. And I don't really care what happens tonight. If one person, one kid, one family, we can reverse prevent chronic disease, improve lives, stop accelerating aging, and add 10 years of vibrant, life to someone that's if one person takes that out of here tonight then this will have been a great talk uh, the mission is to give you a thirty thousand foot view of chronic low-grade inflammation that drives our epidemic of chronic disease and the exposome the exposome uh, was a new paradigm in looking at health that started around 2005 it's all the modifiable modifiable determinants of our health over our entire lifespan and those things account for 60 to 70 percent of premature deaths uh, worldwide and in america also i want to go over genes are not our destiny talk about it, what we call epigenetics how we talk to our genes and tell our dna what to do every day and this is about getting and staying well and by well i mean functioning at your best vibrant health and i'm going to talk a lot about health span because everything i'm going to talk about will span not just your lifespan but your health span how much of your life you can be vibrant and vigorous and picking up your grandchildren and throwing your grandkids on a wrestling mat whatever you want to do uh, and also this has a lot to do with what i wish i knew 20 years ago but wait until medical science actually caught up with my mother uh, and this is me, and I'll just tell you my story real fast, briefly. About 20 years ago, I didn't feel well. I talked to the doctors, uh, you know, in the lunchroom like we do and all that. I actually went and saw doctors, and everybody said, you're just working too hard. It's not a problem. Everything's fine. And I said, but there's something wrong. Finally, I got a diagnostic label, and I realized there's really not much in the name of the diagnostic label cause it's really the tip of the iceberg it doesn't tell you a cause and then they said oh no there's some treatment there's a drug you can take oh but people are dying you're going to hold the drug back for a while but they'll release it again i said wow really well what's what caused this well we don't know and so anyway that started my journey uh from the step world and today uh greg can you roll that for a minute Today, the goal is to broaden the lens. I'm going to go off video from it. An event seen from one point of view gives one impression. Seen from another point of view, 
it gives quite a different impression. But it's only when you get the whole picture you can fully understand what's going on. And before you get too far into the weeds, Dr. Nutella, be sure to click your microphone back on. Thank you, Greg. A lot of people paid me in advance to turn my microphone off. I don't know if you know that or not, but <laughs> it's okay. But the point is to broaden our lens, both as patients. I'm speaking to you as a doctor and a patient and a former patient, but really to broaden our lens. And, uh, you know, we're all siloed. Uh, we're all conditioned, we're acculturated now to believe one thing after the other, we're inundated with information. Um, and we really want to broaden our lens, as you can see here, and see the whole picture. Fortunately in medicine, the bridges are happening, the silos are breaking down, uh, but medicine moves at a very slow pace in America. Uh, also, I'm going to go back here, I had to really search for things that were meaningful to me in my life, that I could survive this, that I... I, they sent me to a room and said, here's the patients you're going to be like. I cried. I said, oh, my God. I have cried for the people. I said, this is going to be me? Anyway, the point is I had to really dig down for my why in life, and I couldn't give up. I had to be tenacious and get to current medical science. I knew I could find it, even though I had great doctors, but there had to be more than this. Uh, it takes me to Irvine Page. Uh, back to, anyway, uh, Irvine Page was a tremendous guy, uh, and in the 30s and 40s, he was talking about hypertension. We should treat it as killing people, and he said, well, even with his beautiful wife giving lectures all over the place, even on artery diseases of the heart in the 1950s, they didn't even look at his wife. They were so bored with his topics, but the point is Irvine Page and this group here from Cleveland Clinic uh, they pioneered every organization we have for hypertension, for heart disease, for patient advocacy. Uh, he actually discovered angiotensin, which today is at the forefront of medicine and everything we do. Frank Gifford, uh, and this is our Harriet Dustin, who then came to UAB from the clinic. But at the time, and he was writing about hypertension since the late 30s, but even up until the 40s, uh, the perspective was, okay, people are dying. Three out of four hospital beds were filled with hypertension and they called it essential. Oh, we don't know a cause, which is terrible because we can always find a cause for everything. But uh, even uh, Roosevelt got taken to the cleaner, so to speak, by Stalin uh, at the altar uh, and Stalin, or. Uh, President Roosevelt was dying from hypertension then, died shortly after that. And his doctor said, oh, this is great. Not great, but oh, we're following, we're watching the natural history of hypertension. But Irvine Page stuck with it. Uh, Harriet Dustin joined him. Frank Gifford was a magnificent clinician, Cleveland Clinic. And then Harriet came to UAB and started another uh, wonderful uh, uh, advancement in hypertension and vascular disease. But I asked myself, I love them. I asked, what did I get from them? <laughs> this is it. It carried with me my whole life. And he talked about this since the 1930s and actually published it in writing 1957, but what he called the mosaic of hypertension. And I realized he was talking about systems biology, the biology of life. All the things that happen every day, vascular damage, hyperinsulin, uh, estrogen, uh, oxidative stress, uh, genetics, uh, the environment. And he said, no, there's some mosaic, there's multiple things. And that then was the theme and still is the theme for hypertension in the world. And nothing's really changed. And the way that we treat heart failure, which is worse than any cancer prognosis today, um, the way we treat that is based on everything that came from them. But what I learned, what stuck with me from a lifetime is look, because what you see on the surface is the tip of the iceberg. What the meat is really underneath. And that's where all the action is. 
uh, by the time we see the fruits on a tree, it's well advanced that what we need to do is be involved with the roots. And I'm gonna show you some of that tonight. And why I'm showing you this is because we do have an epidemic of premature death and chronic disease in America. This graph over here, I'm just showing you from 1950 to, to current, everything in the world, autism, uh, which is also an inflammatory disease, mental health, another inflammatory disease, obesity, diabetes, uh, Crohn's disease, I could put psoriasis on here, lupus, uh, everything is dramatically increasing. Six out of 10 people, this is incredible, six out of 10 people in America, and this is conservative, it's probably seven or eight out of 10 people have a chronic disease. At least four out of 10 Americans have two or more chronic diseases. And then you say, well, who's getting all this stuff? Well, look at this. This is just fresh data. Age 18 to 34 years old, one of two of them have more than one chronic, have at least one chronic health issue. One in four have more than two. Uh, recent data, cancer now is surging in people less than 50. Uh, heart attacks are surging in people age 20 and 30 and 40 now not cocaine related or anything else, atherosclerosis. And diabetes has increased so much, they changed the name of it. Do you believe that? Uh, it was a, uh, adult onset, but so many kids now are getting adult onset diabetes uh, that they changed the name to type two diabetes. And even when kids get type two diabetes, they get much earlier complications of premature death. But this is all the epidemic that we're dealing with. Uh, also, uh, two big studies, thousands and thousands of patients, show that one out of 10 Americans are metabolically healthy. And these are using very straightforward word things. One out of 10 Americans are metabolically healthy. Nine out of 10 are not, despite the fact that we spend four times what other countries do in healthcare and have the worst outcomes. Uh, Dr. Cosgrove, heart surgeon, uh, and former CEO, the state of our nation is only as good as the state of our health when he was CEO. And, and that really stuck with me as well. 70% of our young people are ineligible, mostly due to health reasons, to serve in our military. Overweight obese, uh, three out of four adults, about half adults, 41% of adults are obese. Uh, and then overweight, three out of four adults. That's incredible, right? And obesity is more deadly than anything else. It reduces lifespan by 15 years. And when we talk about obesity, we're talking about all these terrible things, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, uh, postmenopausal breast cancer, and 13 other cancers, arthritis, mental health. And obesity is a top risk factor, modifiable risk factor now for dementia. Uh, and this fattening of America is very well explained. If we, I don't think we'll have time to go through it, but it's been orchestrated, intentional, uh, and very unfortunate. However, uh, although we're overweight, we're dramatically undernourished. This graph just shows uh, diet quality is poor, about 60% uh, from 2005 to now. And, you know, you say, what? One well, of the most biggest deficiencies are fiber. Okay, fiber is critical for everything particularly uh, to prevent breast cancer, fiber uh, in the diet. So we're deficient uh, in fiber, dangerously deficient in potassium, also magnesium. And, you know, I'll just say this, eating an avocado at least one a week, a great study came out a couple of weeks ago, reduces cardiovascular death. But right here, we could like really fiber, we eat about 12, 15 grams a year. We should be eating about 100 grams. So even if we shoot for 40 or fit or 30 or 40, 50, that's great. But just in an avocado and send your kids with a handful of walnuts every day and get off the sodium. That's another inflammatory issue. Our kids are overdosed with sodium as are adults, a uh, driver for hypertension and heart disease, et cetera. But use no salt. If you have that taste and you got to have salt, instead of sodium salt, use potassium salt, no salt. I know every, everybody criticized me, says, oh, they hate it, but I, I think it's great. The other great news though, if there is any good news about obesity, is that it's finally considered a disease because they found out for years that doctors deprived patients, treated them badly, 
uh, because of all that, uh, uh, the terrible perspective we have on people that are different, which is inexcusable. So it has been a disease now. It is finally getting attention. Uh, and I will say obesity is multifactorial, but we can help people. We can prevent obesity and we can help obesity dramatically, not with big time drugs, not with big time uh, gastric bypass and all that, which is another issue. It's wonderful when appropriate, but it's substituting another issue, set of problems for uh, that problem. Also, I wanna talk about obesity in your abdomen, in your abdomen. And that's if you get your waist, uh, or waist to hip ratio is a little bit big. That is actually becomes an inflammatory organ of its own. Do you believe this? And insulin drives this fructose and all the processed foods puts fat too much insulin and the fructose puts fat in the belly, but it's not fat. It's a, it's an inflammatory organ that's spewing all kinds of toxins all over your body. Uh, that causes inflammation, heart attack, uh, lipids, um, premature death, stroke, cancer, more so in women, diabetes. So uh, this is an important vital sign is your waist. Uh, and I will tell you that, uh, and it, it varies with ethnicity, but 40 inches for men, which is pretty generous. In other countries, it's 38, 37. For women, 35. The point is that uh, the average waist size in America is far above this. So it's average, but it's not normal. It's toxic and life-threatening. Uh, and you have to get to the underlying cause. Uh, also, these are two of my friends. Uh, and I'm showing you because they have the increased abdominal girth, the increased waist, if you measured it, increased waist dip ratio. He's running all the time. He had a heart attack recently, got stents. He knows why he can't lose this. It's what he's eating. Uh, even though he's running night and day, you can't work through that with exercise. Uh, it's all the other input that you get. Uh, and he's a TOFI, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And if we did a, an MRI of his abdomen, I'll show you what we would find and what I mean by that. So you don't have to be obese to have abdominal adiposity or abdominal obesity. And if you do, that's a terrible risk factor. Okay, insulin resistance is a big deal. And the average American now, rather than eating uh, 40 teaspoons of sugar a year, eats 140 pounds of sugar. Come on, really? I couldn't feed a herd of horses with that. Like, anyway, so the point is we're really uh, overboard with sugar. This is an insulin receptor. Insulin's supposed to attach to the receptor to the wall. And then if it's got, got energy and nutrients in it and exposures, the insulin attaches to the receptor and the glucose, the blood sugar, goes into the wall, into the cell. But if you're having so much insulin all the time, the wall doesn't respond anymore. Particularly if your mitochondria your energies aren't working. Um, and too much energy puts this bad inflammatory fat in your abdomen in your abdomen, not under your skin here, but in your abdomen, it's called visceral adiposity tissue, VAT, not SAT, not subcutaneous adipose tissue, visceral adipose tissue. So that fat goes there, it's the inflammatory organ, you get the big waste, muscle wasting, and you get a fatty liver, fatty liver, and that's an epidemic right now, 40% of people in America have a fatty liver, uh, but this insulin, too much insulin also causes a thing called arachidonic acid, which is bad. It causes bad inflammation in your body and cell death. And the more of this arachidonic acid stuff, this makes estrogen. Uh, hot, increasing carcinogenic risk. risk. Uh, but anyway, and this insulin resistance thing happens years before people get prediabetes and diabetes. And that's why I'm showing you again, what we see on the fruit of the tree is way late. It's been years in the making. Also, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, most common endocrine disorder affects one out of 10 young women, is also an insulin resistance disorder. All right, this is little Gregory. Um, and I, you know, I got this all the time, pinching my cheeks from all, all my big Italian family. I don't want to talk about it. It's too traumatic. But the thing is with diabetes and prediabetes, 
one out of two adults. And the big message here is diabetes is reversible, modifiable, preventable, like the vast majority of heart disease, 80, 90% is preventable, and a lot of it is reversible. And I put my picture up here because when I was a kid, I had diabetes. I started insulin, and my mother said, no, I'm not doing this. And my mother put me, she became my health coach. She was a, didn't have an education. She was a professional. Um, uh, she was a professional waitress at Philadelphia pubs. My father was a barber, God bless him. And they said, no, we're not going to do this. And they put me on uh, unheard of at the time. And uh, the primary doc care doctor like was really upset about it, but it worked. And I lost my diabetes. Anyway, insulin resistance is pretty common. Great recent study from UAB, tremendous place. One of the best medical centers in the world uh, showed uh, young people, a lot of them had insulin resistance. So if you take pre-diabetes and diabetes and insulin resistance together, you're probably talking seven, eight out of 10 people. And I have to say this, pre-diabetes, <coughs> excuse me, there's nothing pre about it. And by that, what I mean is, when you have what the doctor calls pre-diabetes, that means your blood sugar is a little bit high, they say, but not high enough that they're gonna call you diabetes. But you're developing the same identical complications, terrible complications, uh, as someone who has a diagnosis. So I don't recognize pre-diabetes. Uh, that's diabetes uh, because it's the same thing. Also, I will say that when we're talking about insulin resistance, pre-diabetes, the best test to do is fasting insulin. That's another story. Also, diabetes dramatically increases the risk for cognitive decline and dementia. Dementia is called type 3 diabetes now, believe it or not. I work with the NFL Alumni Association. What a privilege to serve them uh, and uh, part of their campaign against diabetes and obesity. And again, the kids thing, uh, earlier complications, and so many kids are getting diabetes now that, again, they changed the name from adult onslaught to type 2. Uh, sugar. Uh, one of my friends, Pat Hart, uh, I went to high school with, we out, went out in the sugar cane field one day and started eating it. And it was so hard to eat. But sugar cane was great because it had so much uh, fiber in it. So it wasn't stripped. It wasn't sugar. It was pretty good. And it took so much energy to eat it. The point I'm going to make here, these are uh, sweet sugary beverages. Get this. You won't believe this. You're giving your kids Mott's apple juice? Really? Mott's is nothing but sugar and metals and heavy toxins. Or look at Similac. It's like milkshake for, for infants. And you know, there's an infant obesity epidemic now. But I'll go through this real fast. The bottom line, here's the take home point. Okay. Uh, the more sugar, sugar correlates very strongly with dying prematurely from heart disease and every other cause imaginable. Did you guys hear that? Greg, can anybody hear me? Am I talking to myself? Yeah, we sure can hear you. Okay, but I, I want to make sure everybody, particularly parents, hear this and adults. Sugar intake, death, premature death, heart disease, unbelievable, right? Okay, uh, another one, uh, high sugar, uh, heart disease and stroke. But this is pretty profound, this one, uh, sweet sugary beverages and now sugar. Uh, anyway, uh, and I will tell you real fast, I have to tell you this, Coke, my favorite. And it's kind of they're fascinating to tell you how smart uh, everybody is, that they uh, put caffeine in it, okay, revs you up a little bit, but caffeine's a diuretic, so you urinate, and they put salt in it, and the salt makes you thirsty, and so you're you're losing volume, and then they cover the salt with the sugar. So the point is, you're gonna be drinking Coke after Coke after Coke, you're never gonna get quenched. This is unbelievable Gatorade. I see parents using it all the time. And 1992, when the Gators uh, won a championship, Pepsi, very smart, <clears throat> went and bought Gatorade. And now, you know, this is not a sports drink. This is all sugar and fructose type stuff. Again, fructose goes right to the liver, goes right to fat. Uh, and we have an issue with the fatty liver thing. Uh, 
I, I, met, I didn't pay attention to one of the last slides. I won't go back, but I'll tell you, fatty liver, uh, again, from what we're talking about, affects about 40% of uh, the American population right now, and it's becoming a leading cause for eight to 10,000 liver transplants a year, including in kids. Um, I'll move on. I don't, this would be another talk, uh, how this happened, including with Richard Nixon's war on poverty, uh, and then when they got high fructose corn syrup in 1966, uh, and this false notion of no fat, and that's another story based on false data by a great researcher, Ansel Keys, but that resulted in all this dairy milk and chocolate milk to help kids drink more. Cows are pregnant most of the time. We're getting all these hormones, all these other things out of it. Um, yeah, I remember, boy, uh, yeah, I drank a lot of milk. Uh, all right, never mind. And now we have recent guidelines for obesity. But what I was going to tell you, yeah, and why I put myself up with obese? This was rough for me as a kid. I grew up in a tough neighborhood. And my Italian relatives pinching my cheeks all the time. Oh, cute little Gregory. And I'm the only one that didn't have a nickname. There was Bunny, Little Bunny, Big Bunny. There was Big Chachi, Little Chach, uh, Antonio. But I was always Little Gregory. Uh, and I put my picture here because I was obese. And it was very painful. And that brings up adverse childhood experiences. And I want to mention this, very sensitive around your kids with everything, food, everything you do and their behavior, because adverse childhood experiences account for a very large percentage of adult chronic disease. But let's get back to the new, this is concerning to me, childhood obesity. This just came out a couple of weeks ago. The point is one out of three kids were overweight or obese, one out of five, 20% are obese, and I hope you're sitting down for this one. One in three infants to age two are obese. And we're giving them those milkshakes I showed you, right? Anyway, and then they recommend now that this is really concerning. And the pediatricians, oh, after 15 years of watching kids get obese and become sick adults, now we have something to do. I know what that means. Okay, who's going to do multidisciplinary family counseling, 26 hours, three to six months? Try to see children regularly. Well, why aren't you doing that already? Less sugar. Oh, but now we have the weight loss medications. Uh, I don't know about putting a kid on a weight loss medication for life. And now we can do adolescent bariatric surgery. Again, it reminds me of the tip of the iceberg, not looking at the roots of the tree or at really what's underlying this. And I can see talking to a mother now. This is like what we encounter with patients. Oh, you have a disease caused by things around you, what you're eating and your behavior. Oh, should I change that? No, not at all. Give me a pill. And the pills don't work. Anyway, I'll go on. Uh, anyway, IMIDS, immune mediated inflammatory diseases, the best kept secret because everyone has one, one of six Americans. The number who have autoimmune disease, uh, people that have it is uh, equal or greater than a combination of heart disease and cancer combined. And you know, heart disease is the most common cause of death in women and men. So autoimmune, we're talking to a lot of people. It's the most common cause of death in women less than 65, leading cause of disability, pain and suffering. And all the wonderful drugs that we have, as my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Len Calabrese, leading immunologist in the world, will tell you, all every medicine he's ever researched and all the medicines that we use, people still aren't well. And I'll show you why in a little bit. And it leaves unaddressed all the issues like, for example, psoriasis is not a skin disease. It's a systemic autoimmune disease. There's eight or 10 other major symptoms associated with psoriasis. Uh, uh, all three of these, lupus, rheumatoid, psoriasis, but particularly rheumatoid and lupus, you know, th those people aren't going to die from, from their joints. They're going to die from heart disease 10 or 20 years early. And uh, I don't need to show a graph, and we have all these different people. I love this elephant. Somebody saw it's a wall, it's a fan, it's a spear. Uh, autoimmune disease is kind of treated by everybody. Um, so we have a lot of silos, and we wind up with this terrible chronic illness. All right, I'll, I'll move along real fast. But genetic environmental mismatch is really what I want to talk about. 
and our body is great hardware, but we corrupt the software. And so here's the parking lot. Um, and let's just say broccoli pulls in. So broccoli, I'm just picking this in an example, but, and your body doesn't know broccoli, but your broccoli knows that broccoli is a nice motif. Broccoli is a cool thing for your body. Your body knows that it's programmed in. It's a motif. So uh, broccoli uh, in this car space, it's got its own car space. It's in there now. It sends signals to your DNA. And then your DNA says, wow, okay, we got a good motif. We're going to send Nerf 2 all over the body. Nerf 2 is the most powerful antioxidant system that's already in our body. But you got to stimulate it and you have to have the nutrients to, to make it work. And this goes and cleans up every bad thing in your body. Yeah, um, so I'm trying to show you that the motif tells your DNA. Your DNA says, I recognize that motif. And then your DNA pumps out great stuff that saves your life. It's kind of like if you had a keyboard and your DNA were the keyboard, it's whoever's playing the keyboard is the kind of music you're going to get out. Or if you have the hardware, the hardware doesn't change. But if you're putting good software or corrupt software, that will determine what you get out of the computer. Make sense, everybody? I can't hear anybody, Greg, but... Um, you're motif, doing fantastic. Oh, here. What's, what's a motif? A motif is like an appearance. Now, a motif, I see that it looks good. Or a motif is or that pattern. A motif is a pattern. And, uh, and what I'm trying to show you here is the body works on patterns. That's how health and disease work, on patterns. So let me give you now, uh, here's the hard drive. The hard drive is an orchestra. All signals everywhere, nerves connected, hormones, uh, things floating through the blood. Every cell has to connect with the cell beside it. And that group of cells, everything is orchestrated. Um, and it's got parking spaces. So I'm going to give you an example. Here's a sticky bun parking space. Okay, this is processed food. And so the sticky bun pulls into the parking lot and uh, has its own receptor on a cell. Now I'm showing you a cell. This is one cell. The sticky bun pulls onto its receptor. You won't believe it, and I'm not making this up. For the sticky bun, the receptor is the rage receptor advanced glycosylated end products, very toxic stuff. Anyway, uh, and here's a damp, danger associated um, molecular pattern, pattern. So whatever, these things pull into the receptors. Everything is receptors and signaling. Uh, the receptor uh, is activated, it goes into the cell, makes other stuff. And now your body says the motif is a sticky bun. And we're under attack. The sticky bun is a bad actor. We're under attack. So now it sends signals to a thing called nuclear factor kappa beta, which is the Batmobile. And now the Batmobile here, I have an F-150, is going to pull out inside the cell, park on the DNA, and tell the DNA we're in trouble. We're fighting a foreign pathogen here. Happens to be a sticky bun, same thing. Happens to be McDonald's. Uh, and now what happens is the DNA is patterned and sends out hundreds of inflammatory signals. Oxidative stress. Here's stuff called cyclooxygenase. Who cares what you're called? Oh, TNF alpha and interleukin you might recognize. But it throws out all these inflammatory bombs that then go all through the body. It's an amplification system because the body sees the sticky bun and, and this kind of food and says, we're in trouble, we have invaders. So they're, they're telling the whole body, we need help to fight the invaders. And when this happens and you keep doing that, what happens is, doesn't matter, you get a thing called free radicals, oxidative stress, uh, they go and attack other cells and cause dysfunction, kill them, you just get the concept, it's like making rusty pipes, where here's an apple and you let it out and it deteriorates. That's what oxidative stress, and this is what inflammation is. 
because these things go around and hurt the other cells in your body. And they cause a functional abnormality, like here's a blood vessel, for example. The blood vessel doesn't work. We can measure that, just walk in, easy to do. But eventually that function, functional abnormality turns to a structural abnormality. So then you get plaque and you get a heart attack or a stroke. So this is the final common pathway. When you put something here that has got a bad motif or threatening to the body, uh, then it goes through this, basically this final common pathway, receptor, communication, uh, and then this amplification tells the DNA we're in trouble. The DNA sends out all kinds of signals that go all through the body. We're often, I'll give you an example, autoimmune disease, okay, TNF-alpha, interleukin, they're a big one. They have big league drugs that will counteract TNF-alpha. But I'll show you, uh, I'll move on. Uh, and then, so this is the inflammatory mechanism. And your body can only respond to that in so many ways. When you really think about it, it can only be a handful of diseases. Here you have immune disease, Hashimoto's, arthritis. Yes, osteoarthritis is an inflammatory issue as well. Crohn's, lupus, MS. And doctors, MS, don't even tell people that, they don't even tell people, wait, this is an autoimmune disease. Well, what? It's, all, it's MS. Oh, wait, it's an autoimmune disease. It's like lupus. Anyway, the point is osteoporosis, inflammatory disease. Uh, people with fatigue. So I'm trying to say in that world, cancer, cancer, sugar and all this inflammation, cancer, breast cancer, melanoma, lung, then the brain issues, neurological diseases, Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, migraine, depression, mental health, mental health issues, OCD. And then you have the heart metabolic issues, heart failure, hypertension, stroke, diabetes, the lipids, the obesity, cardiovascular disease, stroke. Worst thing in the world to ever see somebody with stroke. And uh, anyway, uh, now I want to tell you about the exposome. And the exposome are all the things that throughout our whole lifespan, from in the tummy to death, they're all the things that impact our health. And they are responsible for 60 to 70 percent of deaths. And I'll just give you a bottom line: the environmental things. And they're all the same things, the environmental things that, for example, uh, they're all promote either cancer and or they mimic estrogen, but they don't do the estrogen doesn't behave the right way. But the, the key fits in the lock uh, or obesogens, diabetogens, it, it, it all kind of culminates in one of the few same chronic diseases in early death, all these environmental things whatever their chemicals, fragrance, I'll tell you real fast while we're walking by this. Fragrance is toxic. When you see fragrance, that's a code word for, you don't know what it is, but it could kill you uh, with anything. Um, but shampoos, and I have to just tell you real fast, this thing uh, with mom, uh, so much happens in the womb uh, and the kid's microbiome in the stomach, we'll go over that, is formed. Uh, 250 toxins on average come out of a kid, of a baby, a newborn. Do you believe that? So, and again, all these kids are being formed. So everything mom does, what she puts on her skin, the air she breathes, everything is affecting that kid and that kid's development and subsequent IQ. Um, anyway, environmental issues. Uh, GMO, uh, I'm sure you all know about that. They're GMO for a reason. The GMO, why they for, for a reason uh, is because the seed company and the fertilizer company are the same people and um, they're genetically modified so they can put a ton of insect type weed killer type stuff and it also makes all the wheat ready to harvest at the same time, makes it the same color. Um, but that's why they're genetically modified. The fact is you can see the guy here, he's putting it, putting it down and that food doesn't come out. So that food goes right into our body, the glyphosate and all that stuff. It really does. Glyphosate's a powerful antibiotic. It tears up the trillions of stuff that live inside us. We'll go over that briefly. Home environment, 
Uh, outside environment is a big risk factor for premature death, uh, believe it or not. And uh, in the home, I don't have that data, but particulate matter that we breathe in is three to five times uh, more than even it is outside. And we'll go over this a little bit. And then I have the moss. The, the moss thing really bothers me. It's like 35 grams of sugar, full of heavy metals. Uh, and then these PFAs, the forever metals, they go in our fat. And uh, they're really toxic. We get them from cookware in our home, from clothes, uh, fire retardants, mattresses are pretty dangerous, um, uh, very dangerous. And again, we're talking about all these things that cause diabetes, obesity, cancer, uh, and then behavioral issues. One, the biggest thing I'm gonna talk about is food. Sedentary now, uh, sedentary is the new smoking, sedentary increase your risk of death. Obesity, I told you, increased risk of death, premature death, stroke, everything else. Stress also, as well as disturbed sleep. And I mentioned this, Destin, Destin. I only mention this, and I tell people, I'm not sure I'm honest with this, but I tell people, uh, if you're going to put it on your skin, it's the same as uh, eating it. And just like people that work with uh, uh, receipts, they have phthalates on them. Uh, that, you know, I want to tell people always wear gloves if you're working with receipts all the time because that chemical is going right into your body. Uh, and of course, drugs, alcohol, and I'm going to talk about breast cancer because this really bothers me later. Uh, and again, all the uh, 150, 180 chemicals on a woman every day, uh, alcohol. Uh, I'm going to give you some big news that just came out uh, in Europe and World Health Organization where they said that no no level of alcohol is safe because of the tremendous risk that they see for uh, breast cancer. Uh, and the last, uh, I should say, so all these things are they're the 60 to 70% of deaths. Uh, all these things, the exposome, are all the things that affect our health through our lifespan. And the last thing, our internal metabolism. If we have a lot of bad waste products inside us, and that also uh, increases our risk of death uh, and uh, feelings and getting sick. Uh, so the exosome, I want you to look at it. Here's your, here's your bucket when you start. I hope it's not your bucket, but you may have some genetic influence, but then on top of that, you add, here's the uh, unfortunate embryo, newborn, 250 uh, toxins wearing a gas mask. Toxins, toxins in our home, which are, terrible. Then we have mods and we have the food, the processed food. I'll show you that. So on top of this, at some point, what I'm telling you is the bucket overflows. When the bucket overflows, you have this chronic inflammation. There's a handful of diseases, chronic diseases and premature death. I'm going to go over it again. So you have infinite insults. Uh, your body recognizes motif. Here's an okay motif. Here's a bad motif. Uh, it signals your gene, your DNA, to then respond according to a good motif, bad motif. Here's a good motif. You know, you get uh, vibrance, uh, long, healthy life, long health span. Here you get a long health span. Uh, ladies very old, she's still playing basketball and walking around. Here you got a bad motif talking to the DNA. You got bad signals. You had the Batmobile come out. And you had all the inflammation. Here you are when I was doing casts, getting a, a stent. And, uh, and here, well, you can't, uh, and here you are having a shorter lifespan and a shorter health span when you uh, are engaging in bad motif behavior all the time. Uh, okay, now we're going to roll on this. This is a mito mitochondria. Does anybody remember mitochondria? Well, anyway. I kind of do. I wish I had listened to Mr. Minertia more than, but at Archner Academy. But anyway, the mitochondria, this is your, your, your battery. Uh, this is your battery. It's energy for everything. If you don't have it, your insulin receptors don't work. Nothing works, okay? Uh, and I'm just going to show you. Every food you eat, everything we eat, and our emotions, our, energy, our activity, our rest. But let's just talk about food for a minute. That all goes into these little baby mitochondria. And the mitochondria got to produce ATP. That's all our energy. Nothing works without it. You feel tired without it. You get sick, chronic disease without it. And uh, it does make a waste product. 
reactive oxygen species, uh, these free radical bad guys that go around and, and hurt other cells. So I'm trying to show you, this is like really intense. And this is the middle of everything in medicine now, mitochondrial function. And the mitochondria, unlike other cells, unfortunately, their DNA is a little bit extra sensitive and not well protected. So they're very susceptible to any, any injury. So you're putting bad food. This is wonderful food. This is a rainbow of wonderful food. This is a lot of chemicals and sugar and fructose, very dangerous. Anyway, so, and these are just some of the things that impair our mitochondria, stress, not enough sleep, sedentary, not enough activity, too much insulin, uh, all the chemicals, uh, inflammation, free radicals, inadequate sleep. So, and again, when these mitochondria are not taken care of, and they're walking around like this instead of with their heads up, they're producing also free radicals, which goes and hurts them more. But this is the core. And I will say, before I forget, <laughs> your brain and your muscles use most of the energy in your body. Isn't that incredible? Not your heart and then your liver. But what, why I'm bringing that up? Because your brain has a limited amount of mitochondria. So not only do you have less in your brain, but I already told you the mitochondria are very susceptible to any injury. And that's why it's common that when you have mitochondrial abnormality, dysfunction from our lifestyle and what we're eating and toxins and things like that, that your brain feels it the most first. Okay, here's another thing. Let's eat this. I just had one a couple hours ago, so I'm falling asleep right now. But uh, whatever, I just want to show you this. Food is information. And this is a real a real deal. Like, like we call it metabolic endotoxemia. Uh, it causes chronic inflammation. It's a big deal. It leads to obesity, diabetes, fatty liver disease, heart disease, premature death. But the message here is that you're eating this. It's a bad motif. Food is information, and it gives you that nuclear factor kappa beta, the bat Batmobile, and remember all these inflammatory things. So you're causing inflammation all through your body just by eating this. Plus, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. We cringe when we hear C-reactive protein. Plus, it uh, causes C-reactive protein, which is a marker of severe inflammation. And not only in this case, not only CRP a marker, but it also causes inflammation. So now we have inflammation causing inflammation. And this all this happens within an hour of you eating. That's why you start feeling bad after you eat an hour or two afterwards. And it can last for three or four hours. And then if you're going to eat this all day and all night, that kind of food, we don't really call it food. It's not really food, but I'll go over that with you. But if you're going to eat this, and yeah, Sure, I do sometimes when I need to feel bad, particularly that whatever that yellow stuff is. But anyway, um, the point is it makes you very sick. It causes systemic inflammatory inflammation, chronic disease, premature death, et cetera. Uh, it knocks out your uh, mitochondria as well. But, and we'll talk about what's in this. What's in this is fructose, sugar, omega-6s, sodium, chemicals. It tears up your gut, so now you have holes in your gut, so to speak functional holes, so that now bad stuff in your gut goes into your blood and causes inflammation. You're blasting off with insulin, arachidonic acid, and making estrogen, and you're putting liver uh, fat in your liver. All right, here's a fish oil thing, because I know at the UAB webinars, and we're going to have to have a, a talk on fish oil another time, but I just want you to hear this. Just look here, omega-6. Look at this column. That's all I want you to do. Ignore everything else. Can you do that? Do you have this like special things you can put over your eye and just look at this one thing? I'm, I'm kidding. But the omega-6, this pathway, and we flood it. And this is what I call the I don't know why I have health problems starter kit. Uh, corn oil, soy, all that cotton oil, all the seed oils, vegetable oil. And that's such a lie, vegetable oil. It's grammatically correct, but technically wrong. That all these oils are the most toxic things in the world. They're full of omega-6s, uh, rancid oils. Uh, anything that eats this stuff, the corn and soy uh, omega-6s, 
uh, we're getting in the chicken. Uh, anyway, then you have all the oils, then you have that food. It's all omega-6 heavy. The point is, get this, follow this. Omega-6 goes down here, makes arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid then goes and causes all this inflammation again. And all these inflammation things go back and cause more inflammation. So what I'm trying to show you is what we're eating, omega-6, we're eating like 20, 30 times of that than we should, that that's driving uh, this arachidonic acid inflammation in the body, uh, chronic low-grade inflammation leads to chronic disease, premature death. Also, all that stuff to too much insulin also drives this, that we make more of this, uh, of arachidonic acid. Let me give you the other side of it. The other side of it is the fish oil side, omega-3 family. So what we want to do, this column and this column, they share enzymes. So what we want to do is make sure we're filling up this column after we kill this column by not eating this stuff. And now we want to fill this column up with stuff like flax, chia, hemp, and walnut to tie up these enzymes so this doesn't work. And then after we do all that, then we want to eat fish oil. And that's another thing, the smash fish, uh, sardines, anchovies, mackerel, but really the best thing is Alaskan, wild Alaskan salmon, not Atlantic salmon, no. But the point is most people don't get enough of that. And then we have to worry about eating mercury. So yeah, here's fish oil. Fish oil is EPA and DHA. This other stuff is not fish oil. EPA and DHA are fish oil. This is in the omega-3 family. Anyway, so when we give, after we've done that, none of this stuff here, cut down your insulin, fill this up, flax, chia, hemp, then we give the fish oil, and then the fish oil uh, blocks the enzyme that goes to arachidonic acid. Uh, and furthermore, last thing I'll say, fish oil, there's other, other downstream things from fish oil that are incredibly powerful anti-inflammatory agents. So yeah, and fish oil, uh, one, yeah, it does improve survival. Uh, it does help greatly with autoimmune disease. Don't go out and take it. Uh, a lot of it's toxic. You have to know uh, uh, Nordic Naturals, what I use. And I don't even want to tell you how I used to badger companies. I know what's on the fish oil. Uh, and we're going to give you a handout to tell you how to look things up too. But, and then we could talk about the dose depending on the indication, but they're all things for another time. Uh, but uh, I want to hit that omega-6 thing. Okay, now I want to tell you about the, the microbiome. I don't know if you guys are know the microbiome. Here's a picture of Mr. Barry before we took the conference. And what you can see here is that he's full of microbiome stuff, bacteria, viruses, fungi, things we don't even know about. And I will tell you, in our tummy, we have in our tummy, uh, let me start over and tell you the tummy contiguous with the skin, stick your finger down your neck, your mouth. It's okay. But the point is it's a tube from bottom to top, top to bottom. It's a tube. It's a tube. It's got a single layer of cells in it, but it's still outside the body. It's our largest interface or barrier to protect us from the outside world. And inside, there's trillions of things that live, and they live in colonies like this, big colonies. So you have the Polish neighborhood, you have the Italian neighborhood in South Philadelphia, uh, you know, all this, but you have colonies, you know, swarms, colonies, and they each have a function. Uh, and inside, they make neurotransmitters for the brain. This is where 80% of our serotonin for the brain is made, believe it. Uh, it's a critical symbi symbiosis. Be between them and us. And they have a hundred times more genes than we do. And there's a thousand times more of them than there are of ourselves. And it's critical for our metabolism, uh, for nutrients, for making vitamins, even drugs now, they can adjust, they can treat the microbiome to uh, optimize uh, responsiveness to chemotherapy. So this is a real thing. This affects every part of your body. The other really critical thing is immune function that in a kid, and these are immune cells, and 70% of our immune system is in our gut. And here's a picture. Here's the inside, the tube, all the villi. So we have a 21 foot square feet. 
and a surface area of two tennis courts, two to 4,000 square feet in that surface area. Uh, and here's all the lymph tissue around it, 70%. So this, these genes swap with our genes, a lot of interaction and uh, uh, our, our, and our heart health really depends in large part by this metabolic factory in our gut. And in fact, I'll show you over here, the pathways, our gut talks to our brain faster than our brain can talk to our gut. So that gut feeling is real. And this is by a vagus nerve and neurotransmitters, hormones, metabolites, all these things uh, talk to our brain and interact. In fact, when I did years ago at school, they said, oh, this is the second brain. And now we're thinking this is the first brain. I will tell you, uh, also we need it for uh, gene expression, also uh, for decreasing the bowel makes things called short chain fatty acids that decrease cancer risk and reduce inflammation. And I will mention briefly fecal transplant. You can put it in a capsule, however you want to do it. Uh, C. diff kills about 40,000 people a year. Um, and again, this is like what happens. And I will, I'm trying to say too much, but with kids, the microbiome comes from mom. And the microbiome is really critical. And I will mention this, antibiotics are toxic and not my opinion. The world opinion for the last 20 years, 100 years has been, oh, we need to be really careful. But I tell you, it's hard to tell mom, oh, no, no antibiotics, you don't need them. But people don't realize this, this really changes your metabolism for one to two years, particularly in a little kid. And in a little kid, say, for example, who's born in C-section, they don't have the microbiome of mom, they have a microbiome of my surgical mask in, in uh, delivering the baby. Uh, and even if we give that little kid's antibiotics, that predicts disease by age seven or eight, that they're gonna get asthma uh, and a couple other diseases, for example. So this, this microbiome is uh, really critical. Here, you can see how bad this microbiome, there's no diversity. You don't have all the swarms. You have a couple bad guys. This could be lupus. Uh, for example, somebody uh, getting pseudomonas and we could treat them and they would feel better. Could be candida, could be yeast. Uh, but uh, anyway, the fecal transplant uh, actually is incredible. The difficulty is who to get the feces from, who's got a great microbiome. But C. diff, uh, for people that don't respond to medicine, uh, rather than have 40,000 people die a year, fecal transplants are proof for that and very effective. Uh, it's even been shown effective in autism, but still being studied as well as obesity. That's another story. We can take a thin mouse and, uh, and a fat mouse uh, anyway, and we can change their microbiota and make them something different. So uh, it's really funny who's in charge. Well, just so you know, you're not eating for yourself, you're eating for them. And they really need to be healthy. Uh, and actually sometimes when they're not healthy, we're eating for them. Or uh, if you have candida overgrowth, you're actually eating for them. They're kind of directing those cravings. All right, here's another gut feeling. I want to share something with you. This is common in life. Poor dietary choices, stress, uh, low acid. Yeah, and that's right. Stress causes a low acid in your stomach. But everybody in the world is on a proton pump inhibitor, toxic drugs. Um, and then when, even if you took a normal person, put them on a proton pump inhibitor, then once you take them off, they're going to have a massive rebound of acid. You can, it's, you have to be very careful with that. The point is low stomach acid, uh, heavy metals, medications, infections, stress, pet diet opens up our gut. So here's our gut right here. Uh, and there are bridges that are, are together here. And Dr. Nutella, if you're using the whiteboard, go ahead and click that pencil because I don't think we're seeing you right on that. So just so you know. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I didn't no, you're good. There we go. Can you see me now? Turn whiteboard on. Okay, I got it. All right, here's the, uh, this is your, inside your tummy, the single layer cells. And here's the point. Uh, I apologize for that. Boy, I've been using my pointer all over the place my goodness all is good anyway uh here's the uh little bridges a thing called zonulin opens them up and your body's very selective what it lets in and here's inside your body the blood and everything right so this is all the bad stuff out in the aluminum of your gut uh and then the little bridges open up and they say okay something good i'm letting it in 
But when you have all these other things, stress, uh, abnormal microbiome, you're taking Motrin, for example, uh, steroids, uh, if you have cis systemic illness, if you have low acid, if you're eating heavy metals, uh, then these gates go open and stay open. And you get a lot of uh, things that your body says, hey, these are a bad motif. And then your body says, uh, this is a waitress here who says, okay, I'm handing this ball off. Uh, this is a bad motif. I'm giving it to you guys. And these like soldiers come up kind of like pouring hydrogen peroxide over uh, somebody trying to scale up the wall uh, of a castle. And not only that, they have, and then they go attack it. And plus they attack normal tissue and abnormal tissue. You get collateral damage because they think they're looking for a certain motif. And then uh, you get, it goes to the Roman Empire forces or the Air Force, and they're called antibodies. They come back. But these antibodies then also go all through your body and they eventually may start attacking your knee or certain parts of your body. Hashimoto's, the, the thyroid's a pretty uh, easy target. They're driving by and say, hey, well, we think this looks like the target, but, and while they made a mistake, they attacked your thyroid. Now you have Hashimoto's. This is from a, a wonderful doctor at Fasano at Harvard. Uh, really who pioneered celiac disease, but this is becoming the whole paradigm now for autoimmune disease, chronic inflammation uh, from the gut. Another thing I'll tell you about, uh, oh, this is great, Greg. How do I get rid of these markings? There should be a clear, I'll hit clear. There you go. Oh, you're right, thank you. Okay, I've never done this, used this. Oh, this is very cool, I get it, okay. All right, now I'm just gonna talk about I have to turn this off so I can see. Okay, got it. All right, this, oh, this is irritable bowel syndrome. And what, what I'm gonna show you, if you look at the top left corner, uh, that's bad. There's no diversity in the gastrointestinal microbiome, right? There's just some bad guys. You don't have 10, uh, 10 swarms of uh, healthy guys in there. Uh, and I just wanna talk about SIBO real fast, just to show you what the microbiome can do. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, irritable bowel syndrome. Irritable bowel syndrome, so many people have, but a good percentage of those people have a thing called bacterial overgrowth. And after they eat, they get bloating. And they, it's, they're one of the few people in the world that can't eat fermented stuff and broccoli or onion, or they can't take probiotics. Uh, easy diagnosis, but it takes years before somebody pays attention and says, oh, I'm gonna think about this. Um, and then I'm just gonna show you here on the whiteboard, uh, what this is, because you might be taking proton pump inhibitors, you don't have enough acid to fight off things, but bacteria comes from your lower gut up into your higher gut. And it shouldn't be there. You get a lot of that stuff, so it makes you pretty sick. And just to show you, this is all the systemic effects you get just from this abnormal microbiome. Nausea, bloating, vomiting, diarrhea, joint pain, malnutrition, fatigue, acne, you know, and skin issues are kind of a chip shot when you fix the gut. Most skin things like eczema and stuff get better real fast. Anyway, and then the last thing I want to talk about on this is a judge that I had. And uh, I'm trying to clear this, Greg. I'm sorry. Let's see if that worked there. All right. Uh, anyway, I can't see the top of the slide, but it's about a judge. And I'll just tell you that the, the judge was a drunk who never drank. And actually a friend of mine, I knew he was legitimate, um, very distinguished person, almost got in a lot of trouble, lost a judgeship, uh, felt sick for a while, had a lot of GI issues and all that, had normal scopes. But actually it turned out uh, that he had candida, uh, another form of dysbiosis. Um, and he had some problems in there. He had candida growing in his gut. And the candida uh, actually was producing alcohol. And so he was drunk and he got stopped. He got DUIs and tested positive, breath test and blood for alcohol. And sometimes we see this in autistic, quote unquote, goofy kids who have uh, candida overgrowth. So I'm just making you aware of the power and even common clinical issues that, uh, that happen here.
uh, with the microbiome. Okay, I'm gonna move on, but I'm wondering how, okay, if I push that, let's see. Okay, good, all right. All right, great. Uh, and the only, the only reason I put the silo up there because you know, it's kind of interesting. It, one university that I love, and I had an experience whereby somebody in one department was getting a, a lot of money for doing research on Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, that kind of thing, millions of dollars for the gut microbiome. Um, but yet the clinical GI department, which is one of the best in the world, didn't do a simple breath test, couldn't diagnose SIBO. Amazing. All right, I'm gonna run on. Here's your liver and then I'm gonna get to the good stuff and I'm so sorry, uh, your patient. All, all the bad stuff that comes in our blood and everything, a lot of it, uh, the forever chemicals like lead goes into, and I'm convinced, well, I'm not convinced. A lot of people think that osteoporosis, uh, postmenopausal, that a lot of the symptoms are due to all the lead. Lead comes out of the bone, lead is stored in bone. These forever chemicals are stored in fat. And that's why a lot of times when we lose uh, fat, uh, we feel bad for a while. But I wanna tell you about biotransformation, detox, if you will. But all these metabolic products we're talking about, uh, they have to go through phase one. Phase one are here, I'm showing you all the, Vel fortunately they're Velcro balls and they're inflammatory. It's like phase one of the liver says, okay, here's something that's really terrible. I'm gonna make it less terrible, but it's still a sticky ball. And if it goes all, all the way through the body, particularly the sticky estrogen and all this stuff, I, it's gonna cause big time inflammation. But you need to have the other part, you gotta have the catcher's gloves for the sticky ball. And that's the second part of the liver function. And once this, the, uh, it hits uh, a catcher's mitt, then you can get rid of it in the urine or the, uh, the uh, stool. So, but commonly people have, the phase one is really revved up for a lot of different reasons that are making a lot of sticky balls, particularly estrogen, okay? Uh, more than phase two has gloves to catch. So all these, all these things then, rather than go from here, oh, rather than go from a sticky ball here to a catcher's mitt here, uh, if, you, uh, if you're not nutrient efficient and have all these great things to catch the sticky balls that are toxic from the early phase of uh, bio, biotransformation, then they go out and cause inflammation all over the body, including carcinogenic estrogen. So we food balances these two as do other things. And I'll try and hurry up to get through this. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about food, leading predictor. This is really important. Food is the leading predictor for chronic disease risk and premature death. Food, I hope you heard that. And the leading predictor for a healthy, vibrant life with a prolonged health span is the quality of food that we eat. So food is actually a, a really great vital sign for your doctor and actually correlates with lab the, that we'll get. Here's the point guys, food, lifespan and health spans improved. You gain 10 years of youthful life, you feel well, best function, we can reverse and stabilize chronic disease, mood cognition, everything is better. Cost effective, no brainer. The food is like molecular signals and, and alters your gene expression, reduces inflammation, gives you energy. Um, and over to the top right, I'm just showing you some great food. There's a thousand molecular signals in there, motif parking spaces that are gonna help you in every way possible. Uh, and again, I don't want you to know that food, you don't need to start learning food by its biological function, but realize that there's a whole world of abundant food out there for health. Uh, also, I wanna go over to the ultra processed stuff real fast. Ultra processed food is the greatest predictor of chronic disease and premature death. And I don't use the word diet, it's a pattern of eating. Healthy pattern of eating is vibrancy, health span and lifespan. 
And just so you know, what we call processed and, pro and an ultra processed food. You can see the clown on the right and, and the apple, and then the apple on the left. And basically what we're talking about is stripped carbohydrate. Uh, there's sugar, that's it, pretty much. And fructose, again, fructose doesn't drive insulin, but fructose goes right to your liver, causes fatty liver, causes fat uh, and inflammation. But again, the processed food is all chemicals, metals, hormones, full of antibiotics, pesticides, and all these things we call carcinogens, uh, estrogen disruptors, obesogens, and fructose is very addictive. Uh, and the point of saying ultra processed and processed food means that compared with the real food, with the apple, it's lost its nutritional, it's lost its nutritional intent. Furthermore, uh, it, it's new antigens, new threats to the body. And again, these are things that didn't exist for my grandparents. Uh, in the supermarket, in the supermarket, ultra processed stuff. And uh, this is from Canada last year, new labeling requirements, and it's gonna come here soon too. But uh, now they're gonna label this kind of stuff that we buy in the store food warnings are going to be on it, that it can cause cancer. Um, and in the middle where you see the supermarket view when you take your glasses off, it's unbelievable. You see all the, there's like 30,000 products in the supermarket today. Years ago, uh, there was 300, 400. And, but it's all basically the same thing. And Americans were eating processed food are only, only eating like 30 things, basically their whole life. And the other last thing I'll say here, we need to have a uh, talk on food labels, but American Heart Association, American Diabetes, they don't know, these are not healthy foods. Uh, so, you, you know, information is very important. That's why we gave a handout that I want you to use. Calories, don't let anybody tell you the top left food is equal to the top right food. The top right food will cause abnormal development in kids, impaired IQ, feel bad, people get accelerated aging, immune weakness, chronic disease, reduced health span, premature death, and wind up on a cath lab table. Yeah, orange juice too, come on, really? It's nothing but sugar, there's nothing worthwhile in it. The vitamin C, the little bit of vitamin C is, is really worthless, but the amount of sugar in it is toxic. Over here, going back to the um, Mediterranean type world, uh, I can't see it on here, but the top left with the beautiful food, the, the rainbow of beautiful food, rainbow of nutrient dense food, uh, you gain 10 vibrant years, vitality, function, life, immune function. Everything I'm talking about is also your immune system. Also health span, lifespan, cost effective. And I use forks now instead of stents and invite people to the dinner table instead of meet them on the cath lab table. And uh, I'll move on. Um, I get, I'll just show you this. This is Mrs. Riley. I have to tell you a fast story. I went to the best high school in the world. Very, very special, blessed place. I know you don't want to hear it, but I have to say it. And Mrs. Wiley and Mr. Wiley, and he had an Irish brogue, and they were the blessed, greatest people in the world. And one of my teachers, I had a book, and uh, you know, Mrs. Wiley used to let me read books in the back room and, and on the front steps. But one day I was in trouble, and I, was, I knew I needed help for this test. And she said, I have a secret for you. I've been holding out on you. And she gave me cliff notes. Do you believe it? It was great. So I'm going to give you the cliff notes here about addressing disease proximally, up front, proximally. And real fast, I'm interrupted. I saw something about cost effective. Uh, Good health, eating for good health is expensive. They're not true. I, you have to show me data, whoever said that. That's nonsense. I, I don't mean to be critical. But no, I'll tell you what, if I just ate out of the corner of uh, my store, uh, the 10 or 12, 14 unprocessed things, that would be the cheapest deal in the world. Uh, and also, uh, I, I gave you in the handout environmental working group where you can look at, yeah, organic food is better. And I gave you a handout or a link environmental working group you need to really get familiar with but every year they publish uh uh they publish um 
Dirty Dozen Clean 15, foods that you wouldn't want to eat unless they're organic, believe it or not, like strawberries, versus foods that aren't going to kill you if you don't eat organic. Anyway, what I'm showing you here, the top, uh, we can stop disease, prevent it, and reverse it up top versus at the bottom. And I'll, I'll move on because I know uh, we're pressed for time, but uh, that's the whole point of this, that where it says phytochemical uh, immune modulators, <clears throat> the green things are things that we can stop. They're all the bad things we talked about, all the inflammatory things. They're the green things. We can stop all that with food and what we're exposed to. We can stop all that. And we can even reverse disease. Um, <clears throat> so that's what that's all about. But I don't want to spend a lot of time on it now. I'm going to go through this. I'll finish up. Joyous movement. My code word for exercise. Joyous movement. And it really is statistically sitting is the new smoking. And joyous movement, whatever it is, just get up and do it every day. Who cares? Uh, the point is it dramatically improves your metabolism, insulin sensitivity, energy, mood, productivity. It's powerful. Joyous movement uh, gives you more mitochondria and makes your mitochondria work better. Uh, uh, and again, um, exercise, joyous movement will improve survival, will improve the um, functional lifespan, your health span, uh, and there's nothing that doesn't benefit. The, I will give you some practical points. Desk work is now a recent study came out. Extra, take an exercise snack, walk for five minutes, uh, walk uh, for you know five minutes of walking um, every 30 minutes. The point is, I think for at least a minute, uh, uh, to walk every 30 minutes from your desk. The race is on to find out what's the least amount of meditation, exercise, and everything else. Uh, what's the least amount we can do to uh, optimize mitochondrial function and physiology? What's the least amount of effective exercise? So, uh, and, and actually, it's very effective. Uh, my neighbors, uh, I don't know if they went to medical school, but they walk every night after the meals and going for a, a walk, moderate walk, a uh, brief walk every night after meals actually improves insulin sensitivity dramatically. Nature, nature, getting out in the morning sun is powerful. But again, joyce movement uh, in itself is not enough for metabolic health. You need to do the food and the other things we talked about. Sleep is really critical. Bad sleep, I'll just show you on the far right side. Bad, bad sleep here. Um, bad sleep causes the free radicals, the oxidative stress, the inflammation, the insulin resistance, makes you have cravings, you're gonna eat the house down, uh, impairs your cognition, your mood, your impulsivity, makes you fatigue, causes chronic disease, premature death, and sleep is so powerful uh, if you look on the left side of the screen, I'll go back. Uh, at the top, cleaning, restorative, regenerative, rejuvenation. And there's a circadian biology. And at night, we get all this melatonin, which is a powerful antioxidant. Even uh, been used, uh, uh, probably going to find its way as uh, therapeutic in breast cancer. But on the top left, immune resilience, energy, mood, productivity. And the brain and the bowel need this at night. The brain cleans out all its dirty cells at night. Uh, and so the sleep is really critical. Yeah, at least seven, eight hours, but uh, you know how when you've had enough. And the gut also, the gut has its own motor function, uh, believe it or not. It's got a, it doesn't matter what it's called. But so all night when you're not, when you're not harassing it by eating, and that's why you shouldn't eat like three hours before you go to bed, because that gut then is like, Moving along, it's moving everything from the top to the bottom, uh, cleaning out, doing necessary repair and rejuvenation. Health, home, Th this should be your healthy home. Uh, bed, start with the bed. Mattresses are full of stuff. And yeah, look up HAPSY, H-A-P-S-Y, bed. I got them. Uh, and that was a great experience, believe it or not. But 
The point is I found out that I could get a beautiful, organic, safe, a non-inflammatory non, uh, bed. The point is beds uh, are full of toxic chemicals, including flame retardants that do all these bad inflammatory things, hurt uh, our mitochondria, and they're actually very important. Um, and the argument will go, oh, organic bed, that's what I said, really? And yeah, it makes a big difference. But the point is, they're less expensive than most other mattresses I can find now. The bedroom should be minimalistic, have great air. The other thing I ask people about air filters, you got to get the maximal MERV rating uh, and personal products. These are home issues that all can be carcinogenic, right? I'm sorry, I don't have the pointer. All these things can be carcinogenic. And then, and then you can get to the uh, cooking with non-toxic pots. I don't think I want to eat copper all the time and uh, how we cook and uh, oils. Yeah, basically I don't want to get into it now, but yeah, we have organic extra virgin olive oil. That's it. And uh, and then, you know, we can talk, anyway, I, don't, I didn't mean to bring that up, but uh, avocado oil we can talk about. Maybe sometimes a touch of coconut oil. And that's pretty much it for cooking oils. Cleaning products are another source of big deal. Fragrance is code word for poison. Uh, and then you can talk about water filters. And for kids, even garments. And for me, I wear organic things. Um, and I have on the picture here a lot of things. The other big thing is laundry detergent. You see on the top right. And uh, most are full of toxins, pretty bad stuff. Household cleaners on the right I am. Uh, very important stuff in the poison. Uh, this is from the, uh, used to be breast cancer. The breast cancer people, all the, uh, they were getting a lot of money from fracking and, uh, and from the cosmetic industry and then the cosmetic, and I, from the, you know, yeah. And then the breast cancer people said, oh my God, we found out that this is causing breast cancer. So I really admire that they did the right thing and got rid of all that. Anyway, here's uh, moving down the last thing. Just bear with me, okay? This is your brain. There's two gigantic battery cables. Just get it. Two gigantic battery cables, okay? One battery cable, the one on your left, is basically a break. Rest and digest. And so when you need to calm down, you take a deep breath. Or if we need to rub on the neck for a rhythm problem. But we need to bear down for bowel movement. Take a deep breath. That's stimulating this brake nerve, the parasympathetic nerve. Okay, putting the brake on. Everybody's calm. Okay, and then, and then the other part of this is on the right, fight or flight. This is when you walk into the room and you see this gigantic lion, like with a bib on, looking at you. And so this sympathetic, this is the other battery cable. And these two battery cables have to work in balance. For example, every time I stand up, gravity pulls blood to my feet. I should pass out, but I don't because these two battery cables make an adjustment of my blood vessels and my nerves and the pumps in my, in my leg veins uh, so that blood doesn't go to my feet. It comes back up to my heart and my brain, right? So they have to be in balance. Okay, this is stress. And all I'm gonna say, don't get overwhelmed by this. Don't worry about it. Start at the brain to top. And my, my, it doesn't matter. I can't see the top, but I'll do, I'll do this. I'm with the, I'm with the pink dot up at the top where the brain is, the big round thing that looks like a jellyfish. And what I'm trying to say is today in our world, people have chronic stress and that's what one perceives as some challenge. And that can be physical, it could be running a marathon. It could be uh, toxic relationships, but chronic stress and we're stepping on the gas. Okay, that's why we have the, the lion is with us all the time, not all the time, not for 10 minutes now, but all the time, night and day. We're feeling this and it's rocket fuel. And the rocket fuel is, here we go, it's rocket fuel. And the rocket fuel is adrenaline and cortisol, for example. There's our precious kidneys and adrenal glands. 
So the signals come from the brain all the time. And you're getting all this cortisol, you get the big belly, you the muscle wasting, uh, and you get all that anxiety and, and fatigue and oxidative stress and your mitochondria are working. And actually, uh, it goes back to your brain. It goes back up to your brain, the other green arrow, it goes back up to your brain and actually causes brain atrophy in part of your brain. Isn't that incredible? And then remember what I told you about the brain uses the most energy in the body, but it has the least mitochondria. So now you're getting brain dysfunction, your mitochondria aren't working, and the circle, I can't see the top of it, but I'm going back again around to the top of the big green. Okay, and I'm coming back, and it just keeps going around and around. And the last thing to finish up, this is really important on stress, also, in all this rocket fuel, the cortisol also puts holes in your gut. It opens up your gut. So now any bad stuff that's in your gut is pouring into your blood. And like I showed you before, causing an inflammatory reaction. So this chronic long-term stress response will increase premature death, disability, chronic disease, and illness. And it's a very serious issue. Over here, the little red thing, I'm trying to show you how with the chronic stress response, the break thing is kind of minimal. You're over here on rocket fuel all the time. Uh, and on rocket fuel, you're making all the bad stuff, all the reactive oxygen species, free radicals, chronic inflammation. The last thing I'll say is kind of interesting. The heart <clears throat> that, yeah, we have the broken heart thing. And uh, I don't have time to talk about that now, but the point is, that even for chronic heart failure, which is a really terrible thing, um, that this is really the whole paradigm for heart failure now, is that all these neurohormones are on rocket fuel all the time. And every drug we use is diminishing rocket fuel. Okay, so now this is really important. And, um, Molecules of emotion, and I'm almost at the end, guys. Thank you for your patience. Immune resilience, metabolic function, and you. This is who we are. This is who you are, right? Um, the inside and your spirituality, believing in something, anything. But the data is there that if you believe in church, you believe in faith, that that improves health span, how long you live a robust, healthy life and reduce this chronic disease. This is one of my, this is my Italian family uh, years ago, community and connection, community and connection, community and connection is critical. Hugs are important. I'm a big hugger, but hugs are important. And uh, I tell you, you won't believe this one. Uh, there was actually a wonderful study where they took a bunch of people and they said, here you go. And then they and then they injected them with the cold virus. And they found out that the people who got hugged the most, even though they got injected with the cold virus, had less likelihood of getting a cold. So it really does impact your immune system. Having a partner for life, intimacy, gratitude, even though the gratitude has side effects up here, may cause shifts in perspective, may cause feelings of abundance. But these are things that actually affect how long we live and, and how we function. Toxic emotions uh, enter, our, enter our life and they're really destructive. And then I have, I like this, we for wellness, I for isolation and illness. And the last thing I can't tell you how many people, uh, and you know this, you've seen this a thousand times, somebody dies and, and then their partner dies a year later. And depression, grief, anger, loss, those things result in early death and indeed do cause a broken heart. So this is a, another big piece of the puzzle when we talk about the exposome, is the point. Kids, oh my goodness, what an opportunity because you're setting the stage for the rest of their life. You're setting the stage for whether or not they're going to, uh, you can, so you can set up their whole stage, whether or not they're going to develop atherosclerosis starting at age 15, 
whether or not they're gonna have a heart attack at age 30 or 35. This is all in the kids. And again, we develop healthy patterns and yeah, forgive me. No, kids aren't asking for sugar. Kids aren't asking you to leave a bottle in their mouth for, for two hours or suck on uh, that uh, terrible apple juice full of toxic metals and sugar. Those tastes are taught. But again, just give mind, mind to things like food, the bedding, the products, the skin. And again, you're going to put it on the skin, you might as well put it in a bowl and let them eat it. Obviously, the air, the toys, believe it or not. And yeah, the clothes. Also, I'll say antibiotics. Uh, we get most of it. Kids are getting too much antibiotics, not by my opinion, by every society in the world. Um, but we also get it. We get most of our antibiotics, believe it or not, from food and plants. So it's important. And I'd already told you before about uh, adverse childhood experiences. These are all the things our kids are exposed to. So just take a look at, at them. I'm over. I'm over on the right now, and uh, I'm over here. These are all the things. And this is a hero uh, from uh, anyway years ago. The person who told us about lead and that changed the perspective on everything. No level of lead is safe. All right, we'll roll through this. Breast cancer. And every other chronic disease, and I'm, okay, wear pink. Really? Really? This bothers me. No, don't wear pink. Know that ultra-processed foods dramatically increase cancer risk and cancer death, right? So let's change that. Alcohol is now considered class one carcinogen like asbestos as of last week by the World Health Organization. And even before that, so this is from them, no level of alcohol consumption is safe uh, regarding cancer or for our health. And this is one I had that uh, it's really interesting, just starting from a little bit of alcohol, you know, the risk of breast cancer, the risk of breast cancer goes up dramatically. But this was really big news, the alcohol thing, uh, brand new. And personal products are a real issue for women. The last thing they need fiber because fiber is how we uh, have a good microbiome. And if we don't have a good microbiome, estrogen that comes into the gut is reabsorbed. Uh, liver function to get rid of the, uh, like I told you, the phase one carcinogenic estrogen needs metabolism. Uh, and inflammation, as I showed you, that inflammation, arachidonic acid causes uh, estrogen excess. This is out of my field, but I will say this. just. Dense, dense tissue reporting. Dense tissue is increased risk on the mammogram, but yet there's not a legal requirement. So people are battling this out. I hope they win that if there's dense tissue on a mammogram, it needs to be reported. The other thing, uh, radiation, the guidelines are really every two years. I know everybody gets one every year, uh, but the guidelines are every two years for regular risk women. And that radiation builds up. And in America, unfortunately, we do not, all that casts I did on people, there's no record of that. There's no record of radiation and radiation causes cancer. Uh, I really am almost done guys. Uh, if I could, I'm sorry. All right, mental health. And I just have to say this, mental health is health, right? Health is not mental health. Mental health is health. And two things, the DSM, that's the, the big book that the doctors look in and say, okay, it fits this criteria for schizophrenia or this, or bipolar. DSM and the Autism Societies all say, these are people, these are human beings. These are human beings. Yeah, they need a medical evaluation. They need a whole person evaluation, forgive me. I don't see that done often. Uh, and I will say that a lot of mental health now is known to be uh, again, the brain is reactive to everything I just showed you in the mitochondrial issue. It's a systems biology. It's a whole person approach. But I'll give you one example. Uh, here's, uh, I'm talking about serotonin. Serotonin, feel good thing. It's not the addiction dopamine thing. It's the feel good, everything is fine. Um, the tryptophan, uh, we have to eat it. It's hard to eat. There's only a couple things that have it. Once we eat it, uh, and this is all in the gut. 80% of the serotonin, the neurotransmitters, not in the brain. It's made in the gut. You need a good gut to make that, right? And But then if you have inflammation, I'll just say, see, the serotonin doesn't go down to serotonin. 
It doesn't go down to melatonin, which we critically need. Instead, it shunted to other stuff without, you don't care the name of it, quinolinic acid. Uh, and it causes uh, brain inflammation. So uh, anyway, also the mitochondria are really important. I won't go into this. I love this. This is a, a little chromosome thing that codes for disease in the nervous system, mental health issues, cancers, autoimmune disease. Oh, and by the way, it happens to be the same little chromosome that codes for zonulin. Zonulin is the thing that opens up the gut, right? You know, so anyway, this is fascinating to me. Uh, obviously, there's a connection there. We'll find out. Uh, heart of the matter. Um, on the left, I'll just say, when I was blessed to be at the Cleveland Clinic, my very early day, my residency, uh, the vascular surgeons, there's a big surgical hospital, there's a big hospital for everything, big. But uh, anyway, they were doing all this vascular surgery, incredible vascular surgery, and, and they found out, well, people are hot, meaning that uh, three to six to 12 months later, we're coming back dead from heart attacks or strokes. Um, after they had a very successful operation, the same thing, like with me, if we see a stroke patient or I had a heart attack patient, they're hot patients. They're all inflamed. Uh, we know that there's going to be problems. You have to do everything you can with the fire truck and the fire hose to water them down, quiet it down. Uh, anyway, uh, but they did a cath on everybody. A thousand patients had heart surgery on. They looked at the blood vessels and the heart. They said, wow, everybody's got it. That really took us from saying, okay, the artery blockage is right here to no. When you have an artery blockage, all your arteries have a problem. Some of them may be 50%. And actually, when you have a heart attack, you don't die from a 90% blockage. You die from a 30% blockage that exploded. It's a metabolic issue. So anywhere where we are today is finally with infinite insults. Here's all the receptors on a blood vessel. Okay, finite response. The finite response here is this oxidative free radical inflammation, immune dysfunction stuff. You get a functional oh, you get a functional abnormality here of the blood vessel that turns into a structural abnormality, and then we call it high blood pressure. So high blood pressure. Yeah, really is a symptom of the disease in the blood vessel for whatever the insults were. Just the same thing with atherosclerosis. And looking at the top right, uh, today this is where the world is, fighting inflammation, uh, which was on the cover of Time magazine in 2004. And again, to me, I think the world is getting back, even though our students and, and residents don't really sometimes know the history that we should tell them. It's getting back to Irvine Page, the mosaic of hypertension. And this is from Peter Libby at Harvard recently. Listen to this, immune and inflammatory mechanisms mediate every cardiovascular disease in your body. Uh, and again, the silos hopefully are being broken down. Hopefully we're gonna be bringing things to patients. And, um, all right, guys, this is almost it, and I really appreciate it. The nice thing is nobody can throw fruit at me, I think. But anyway, change happens. And yes, we can all do this. We can win as one. We can all do this. Don't let anybody tell you you can't. You have to know your why. Okay, what's important to you? Is it for your kids, your grandkids? What's it about? And then you need a mindset. That's what we tell the NFL guys. You need a mindset. Yeah, and then you need a guide. You need someone you can trust, a guide. A guide who knows what you think you want, but really knows what you need. And you need an action plan. It's not a random thing. Uh, I'm going to offer like a 12 to 14 week program because the only thing that matters is that we help people take baby steps that they can implement happy, wonderful, joyous things into their daily life for them and their kids that will then reverse disease, keep them healthy, uh, and give them a long, vigorous life. And we also all need a team, a tribe. Uh, and actually, whether it's church, community, we all need a team or a tribe. We need reliable information. I gave you some links to get you started for whoever's interested in that. And you have to learn to have an active role in your care, to be an advocate, 
to be tenacious, you have to learn that with the doctors and everybody else. Uh, ask questions. Uh, uh, lastly, I, I love physiologic monitoring. I have a, a one on, but we'll talk about that another time about heart rate variability. Uh, and I'm going to say this is from my mom. Health is your greatest wealth. No, it really is from my mom. who said this for a whole life. I don't want to hear Steve Jobs. I don't know. I don't believe it. My mother said this forever. Health is your greatest wealth. Without it, you can't take care of yourself or those who depend on you. My mom. And I'm showing you the tree because I'm going to repeat it again. When we see the fruit on the tree and you're seeing one doctor and this doctor and that doctor, the roots are all the same. We can look at the root cause and see where the dysfunction is. And the fruit is a very late finding. So the disease is already advanced, but we always have to get to the roots of the tree. All the things that we talked about. Uh, there's always a root cause. Yes, and we can usually see it pretty clearly. Low-lying fruit, so to speak, like the things I talked to you about tonight, they're low-lying fruit for everybody. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper. Uh, and this, okay, I'm going to say in the middle, opportunity. Some opportunities don't come again. Some opportunities are once in a lifetime. Like when I had the privilege to get an education at the places I did, uh, but health is more forgiving. And no one has to travel their journey to better health alone. This is my youngest daughter. Uh, and I will say, go Blazers. Okay. And uh, give me two more minutes. And I will say this, that on my daughter's side, UAB. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, they're going up to the big, big leagues next year. And we'll have Navy and people like that coming to town. So get your season tickets now. But uh, anyway, um, no, years ago, this was Bear Bryant's world, right? Like this was Legion Field. But the great news about Legion Field, my little girl, my youngest daughter, we, had, we owned the stadium. We were like one of the few people there. We knew the lady who baked the pretzels when you walked in. And, and like, we could just run all over the place, like, with the other few people that were at the game. Uh, but now that UAB's got their big time, but anyway, I have very wonderful memories. Uh, you know, who else gets, a little girl gets to dance with one of the best marching bands anywhere? Or hang out with Blaze, come on. Uh, anyway, this uh, guy over here on the far left, uh, this is Man Helping Man. Very, very meaningful to me. Four o'clock in the morning in my early days, a young kid waiting for a helicopter, thinking, oh, my God, what's coming off this helicopter now? This was outside the research building, Irvine Page's building. Got me through. Um, and I think that, um, yep, yeah, and it still gets me through. And we all have to lift each other up. And uh, I'll tell you, like, Anyway, I think that's it. Yeah, man helping man is what it's all about. Uh, we all have to lift and help each other. And again, no one has to travel their journey to better health alone. But thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. That's it for me. Awesome, Dr. Natel. Thank you so much for... Hey, Greg. Yeah. Hey, I'm still here, man. I just got a phone call that somebody saw, saw you leaving the building an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> never, never. And I will say, since you brought up football and you wanted to do a giveaway, the first person to put the name of the conference UAB is moving to later this year will get a pair of tickets, two tickets to uh, an alumni tailgate of their choice during the 2023 season. And I'm serious about that first person to put something in the chat will get two tickets to a tailgate. Greg, do you have time for questions? Greg, yes, I do, Greg. Can I offer one last thing? That, you sure um, can. Yeah, you bet. Listen, uh, for everybody, I just wanted to give you a big overall thing that this is life and death stuff. Life and death stuff. But again, I understand another time, uh, that's another couple hour discussion over nutrition is really powerful. That's 
that's how we keep people from getting stents or things like nutrition and sleep and all that. And we have all kinds of stuff to help people. So again, don't feel overwhelmed. I'm just trying to make you aware of this. And then the next step will be to get a plan that someone can say, hey, I'm with you. This is how we're going to implement it into your daily life. The other, the other big giveaway, uh, I think Mr. Barry forgot, and, and he's tremendous. This is Mr. Barry, thank you. And he's taught me a lot. But um, since we don't have the Super Bowl tickets, the next best thing uh, is uh, Archmer Academy, where I was blessed to, to get an education. And they carried me through. I don't know how they did it. But Archmer Academy, Claymont, Delaware, or at high school, if you answer one of these questions right, you'll get season tickets. <laughs> to the Academy. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, the Archmere Academy, not the Super Bowl, right, uh, or, uh, or UAB, right. <laughs> and it, it's fantastic information, and, it, and it's very hot topic. So we'll start with some of the questions here, and I want to be respectful of your time. So when you get tapped out, just let me know. Um, what are the latest medical advancements for the treatment of RA? You know what? Uh, I'll tell you, uh, Greg. Um, I think the biggest advances in treatment of RA are what I just talked about. And uh, here's what I mean by that, honestly, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, and the fish oil thing I talked about where you block the one pathway, and I didn't go through the whole thing, but after we do all that, then, then we can actually add borage oil and things like that. And that actually helps a lot. And, but what I'm talking about, and unfortunately, RA is one of those few things that does have a very strong genetic influence. But again, uh, everything I talked about, um, yeah, everything I talked about, I mean that sincerely. And I will tell you though, for the person that asked that, check with my mentor and dear friend, Dr. Leonard Calbrace. He's the leading immunologist in the world and uh, you can get his information on YouTube and he's a Cleveland clinic and he's all over social media. Can I use the high sensitivity C reactive protein test to monitor my body inflammation? No, unfortunately, no, it's a good, it's a great question. No, because for example, a lot of the inflammation that we talked about oxidative stress or DNA damage is not evident in a C-reactive protein. There are other tests that we can do to see if you're having DNA damage or oxidative stress. But that's a great question. No, the C-reactive protein, if it's positive in anything, that's a big deal. But if it's negative for the systemic chronic low-grade inflammation we're talking about, that is of no relevance then. What is the significance of an elevated MPO level of 2214? Optimal level is less than 470. Can you repeat that, Greg? MPO. Uh, if, well, you're going to make me pronounce something that I'm not sure if I can. M Milo perozine. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, gotcha. That, uh, I, without looking at the lab result, I, 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 I'm not going to get into that. And that's a little bit more in detail about an inflamed artery and blood vessel. Okay. Uh, two questions that are similar when you're talking about liquids, um, you know, Gatorade, different things. How about 100 calorie Pepsis or zero Gatorade? Any hope in those? Uh, the only hope is that you don't get too fat drinking them. And uh, the, what I can say clearly is we don't have data that they kill you yet or shorten your life, but there is more than enough information with th that they're not healthy for you in many aspects. Furthermore, you tell me, have you ever seen a person drinking Diet Coke lose weight? No, <laughs> you haven't. Because again, they still get the belly fat. And also here's what people say, not what people say. The reality is that when you give that sweet taste that you're still mobilizing insulin and response as if it were sugar. And actually I'm glad somebody asked because all these, all these erythritol, monk fruit, upside down fruit, all these things people talk about 
No, really. And the experts say we shouldn't be, we don't need any sugar. And you know what? We really don't. I, I, and again, that's why I say it's an acquired taste. It's not, and like fructose, for example, that is an all the processed food. There's not even a biological requirement for it. The body can't even metabolize it. It's worse than, in fact, it should be, uh, it is equivalent to uh, alcohol and uh, it's really toxic. It just goes to the fat and causes fatty liver and, and causes fat in your body. That's why, again, Canada really stepped up. They're going to put food warning labels. And How dangerous it is. And the sad thing is, when you really start learning about food, and, you know, I got to tell you, this took me years to, to get into all this stuff, right? It took me years. But when you really learn about the biology of it all, the, um, you find out there's a, an incredible abundance of real food, abundance of real food. And it's far less expensive, not just today when I go to the grocery store, but when you don't have a heart attack, but just on a daily basis, it's incredibly far less expensive to eat food that provides you with positive molecular signals versus food that destroys your metabolism and causes premature death and chronic disease. And I do apologize if anybody's video is freezing. Um, it's technology, sometimes that happens. I apologize, we will have a recording. So coming up later this summer, starting in April, late spring into the summer, we're having a series on youth sports and what parents oh, should know. So it's gonna be fantastic. What would you recommend instead of Gatorade for sports drinks for kids? Good old fashioned water? Oh, no, we could talk about it. Well, why do kids, it depends on the sport and why do they need sporting? What are you talking about? And like, what do they need exactly? If they need an electrolyte solution, we can do that. You don't need all that sugar. You don't need a sugar drink. I just showed you how sweetened sugar beverages increase chronic disease and premature death. So why would somebody want to eat 45 grams of pure sugar? Again, stripped carbohydrate. No fiber, nothing else. It's like an IV of sugar. Why would anybody want to do that? I mean, we would have to be a little bit more detailed and no, Greg, I'd be privileged. Uh, we could figure something out. With uh... yeah, why I say that because one of the most common routes for sugar in America is uh, what they call sweet sugary beverages. Yeah. And everybody's making a, th a gazillion dollars. That's why I told you Gatorade is not Gatorade that I knew. Gatorade is Pepsi's Gatorade after the Gators won the national championship in 1992. And then they put all kind of fructose and bad stuff in Gatorade. With the liver detoxification concerns during weight release, besides consuming organic food, what would you recommend for liver support or toxin mop-up? What, what was the, the thing, Greg? Uh, the first thing you said about- the Sure. Yeah, so this, fat release, toxins and what? This person says with the liver detoxification concerns during weight release, besides- yeah, I, got it. I got it, no, I got it. Biotransformation, because uh, I'll tell you why. And if you ever look at detox products, I don't know why they have them, because you detox with food, right? And you detox with exercise, you detox with sauna, you detox with all these other things I talked about. But if you ever are going to buy a detox product, there's several foods that are for phase one and for phase two. And if you don't want to eat food and you want to buy them, I, I would look, I look at, I take out my list of foods that are really good for phase one. And I look at the list of foods for phase two. If that's what's in those detox products, then they're worthwhile. But there's no substitute for food. When If I want to biotransform uh, or detox, as you call it, then um, I got to have a great microbiome. I got to eat the right food. My microbiome is key. Before I do that, I have to make sure I'm, I have all my energy things going. And I'm going to base all that on food. And I'm going to pick, I'm going to look at my list of like the six or eight foods, like broccoli, for example. I'll just not, not. I know you're going to think I'm like have this thing with broccoli. I don't. But uh, no, broccoli will diminish phase one and upraise phase two. 
and there's all kind of things, baits, there's all kind of foods, abundance of foods that I don't even try to remember anymore. I just look up the list. And so I would do the, you know, whatever I can, uh, there's whatever I can to uh, fix the gut and then uh, fix the gut, meaning make sure I have a diverse microbiome. That means certain foods, certain things not to do. And then I would look up my list of foods um, uh, that will help phase one and phase two and help my mitochondria. So it's the whole package. It's not, yeah. you know, go ahead, Greg. Yeah. 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 No. And, and it's funny you mentioned broccoli. We actually had a webinar a couple of years ago, the science of broccoli and other cruciferous uh, vegetables. So go to our website, find that one, take a look at that. Are there any concerns that even farm garden grown products have pesticides? Should we be concerned with that? Yeah, of course, sure. The farm grown, is that what you? Mm -hmm. Home and farm. Versus farm, firm versus what? I'm guessing organic, other things. I'm... Well, that's right. What's the next? Yeah, I'm not sure, right? Yeah, oh no, if you're talking about pesticides, no, pesticides are a big deal. Fertilizer is a big deal. In fact, you can live 600, 800 miles away. You can live in New Jersey and be affected by uh, anthrazine and uh, other other things that were like 600 miles away. It comes in the water table underneath. You know, uh, so yeah, it's a big deal now. It's really a big deal. Even like to get clean water is a big deal. So yeah, you have to be very concerned about pesticides. Yeah. And you know, it's amazing. When I was a kid, believe it or not, I remember on my bicycle holding on to the back of the mosquito spray truck. Greg, you're probably too young to remember that. But <laughs> anyway, yeah, and we were breathing all that stuff, like unbelievable. Uh, you know, really, really incredible. But no, pesticides are a big deal. Fertilizers are a big deal. And uh, we're talking about glyphosate now also which is a carcinogen big time. And you can, if you, li if you live near a farming field, there's all kinds of stuff you can be filled with. If you live near a military base, there's all kinds of stuff you can be filled with you don't know about. And, you know, and I've talked to, I have people that don't even live near any of those. And when they have these blood levels measured, they're pretty toxic. Yeah, let's, let's do a couple. The last thing I'll say, I'm sorry, Greg. Last yep. thing I'll say, I can't say that organic versus inorganic affects survival, but we can say that if you eat organic, you get a lot less bad stuff come out of you right away because you measure urine when you study that. Um, but I, so if you can afford organic, that's good. And that's why I say on Environmental Working, working Group, they're the greatest thing to go check out products, hair things, beds, uh, anything about your home. But they, um, they will, uh, every year they put out a list, 30 dozen clean 15 of foods. And the 30 dozen are foods that you really shouldn't, no, no human should eat, like strawberries, uh, because they're so full of pesticides, believe it or not. And the clean 15, which are foods that, okay, yeah, they're regular farming, but they're not, they're not really dangerous pesticide-wise, like the 30 dozen are. And that can guide you then to say, well, it's not on a dirty dozen list. I'm not going to buy organic. Let's go with some quick hitters, just short answers, and then we'll wrap things up. When you refer to fragrance, are you talking perfume and cologne or just air fresheners? No, fragrance. Anytime a label says fragrance, yeah, okay. I'm talking about labels. Fragrance is the code word, and every study in the world has looked at what's in a fragrance has found carcinogenic, toxic things in general. Okay. When it comes to wine, not even 30 cc's of red wine like Morgan David for anemia? Uh, that would be up to somebody. I, I just told you the data. You do what you want. Okay. Right? This what, but I, I'll go back and say, I don't know. A lot of this stuff about, listen, for the benefit that you get, with resveratrol from drinking, I wouldn't use that as an excuse ever that, oh, I'm doing this for my heart and this, get out of here. 
But what I mean by that in a respectful way is, um, yeah, I don't know. A lot of that stuff, I don't know. And, and now with the cancer thing, the breast cancer thing with alcohol, and I showed you that, you know, any alcohol at all, and the World Health Organization last week said, hey, any alcohol at all is a risk, you know, for breast cancer or other cancers and all that. So uh, I, I think, I'm not sure, I didn't get the whole question about something about anemia or something. You don't drink red wine for anemia, but whatever the question was, I'm not saying people shouldn't drink or anything. I'm just sharing the information with you. Sure. Yes or no? Can Hashimoto's be reversed? Absolutely. Yes or no? Does Tai Chi, ugh, I can't even say it. Does Tai Chi count as a worthwhile six minute exercise? Can't tell you about a six minute, but Tai Chi is very powerful. Awesome. Uh, last couple of questions. Any insight on Parkinson's and diet? Parkinson's? Parkinson's and diet. Parkinson's disease. Here's the big deal, I think, with Parkinson's that I didn't used to know. Heavy metals and toxins. And uh, that clearly there's an association and sometimes something can be done about that, as well as mitochondria uh, working. And uh, the diet, I don't use that word diet. Uh, it's a bad word. But uh, someone's eating plan would depend on just the whole picture with the, with the patient. But Parkinson's, yeah, and actually there's a gigantic study. UAB is in, in a gigantic study now on Parkinson's disease with the gastrointestinal microbiome, actually. Uh, and there are actually University of Chicago, I think it is, uh, is actually doing clinical work. They're neurologists with Parkinson's disease. So, and actually the GI microbiome alters uh, the medications and the dose of the medications. So there's a lot going on uh, with Parkinson's disease. But if my neighbor asked me and I said, oh, sometimes you find people with Parkinson's or, like are full of heavy metals and then you can, you know, I, I don't, you, you can think about doing certain things. Yeah, correct. Then again, I'm sorry if someone has a relative with Parkinson's, I'm, I'm sorry, that's a tough thing to have. Two more questions. First being this person has been diagnosed with a myriad of uh, chronic diseases since 2019, lupus, diabetes, MS, thyroid, just the, the whole hodgepodge. How do they get the doctors connect the issues instead of treating the symptoms? Does it start with food? Yes, and absolutely. Uh, food, uh, sleep, uh, movement. Yeah, all, all those things. That's why I said they're, they're all low-lying fruit. They're not easy to do. Yeah. And again, if, if you said to me here, go out and eat well tomorrow, I said, well, okay. I got to tell you real fast. There, I saw a doctor last year, and um, and I said, well, what can I do about it, doctor? And he said, eat well. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> no, what, what are you talking about? He said, I don't know. Eat well. I said, well, why did you tell me that? Anyway, so, but the point is like, no, it's not intuitive anymore because again, as I said, we will go into the supermarket, we see 30,000 items versus 300 items we saw 25 years ago. And the reality is 99% of the items we see in the supermarket have all the same stuff that is actually hurting our body and uh, leading to premature death. Oh, so I got, we'll say something that caught my eye. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't answer the question, but... Uh, the autoimmune thing, that's another important thing about autoimmune disease, um, that it dramatically increases your risk for a second and third, et cetera, et cetera, autoimmune disease. And like I showed with the big umbrella of inflammation, one thing leads to the next, right? So for that person who asked that question, I think the answer would be that one doctor's got to drive the ship. One, and everybody on the healthcare team is invaluable. It takes a team. Mm -hmm. But somebody's got to drive the ship and look at the big picture and say, okay, inflammation is the overriding thing here. What can we do to quiet it down and to stop it to keep happening? Last question we have for you. Osteoporosis. What's an effective action plan in a nutshell? I'd have to think about that more. I don't know. Okay. Again, but I have to say real fast, milk. Actually, uh, I know all this milk. Kevin Gallagher and I drank, trying to get big to play football, all that. 
But no, actually, milk is not not a great thing. And uh, high milk uh, regions of the country actually have worse osteoporosis. Uh, Greg, I guess for osteoporosis, the biggest thing for me would be to find, look under under the roof and see what's under the hood. Is is your thyroid disease? Is your celiac? Okay. Ah, see, like celiac disease. Sometimes people don't look for. You know, uh, was your smoking? Was it a, a small, you know, uh, Caucasian woman? Is her family history? Is her alcohol? Um, and is her chronic inflammation? People forget that that is a big part of osteoporosis. So I don't want to give an answer like that, but I will say milk is not the answer. Calcium is not the answer. We don't do that anymore. Make sure your vitamin D is 50 or more. But other than that, I'm going to be careful on this one, right? Yeah. I, I think, again, because I think the real issue with osteoporosis is people jump to a drug and don't review the considerations for what could be causing this. I'll say that's quite fair. So, Dr. Natel, thank you so much for spending the last little bit with us and, and taking us through chronic disease, answering our questions. It's been very informative to us as well as the audience. Oh, what a privilege, Greg. And, and again, for UAB alumni, God bless you guys. One of the best schools around. And uh, what a privilege, Greg. You know, uh, again, I, I don't know if you said, but yeah, I did my cardiology training here years ago after Cleveland Clinic. And uh, yeah, what what a um, what a tremendous place. And Mr. Barr, you, did a, you do great work over there, communications Thank department. Thank you. I Thank appreciate you it a lot. And just a reminder to everybody, this webinar has been recorded. We'll be uploading it on our website tomorrow. As an attendee, you'll receive an email with a replay link. And stay with us. We'll have a chance at the very end uh, for you to leave feedback on how this webinar was and what we can do in the future. But first, be sure to check out upcoming webinars we have. On Tuesday, February 28th, we'll welcome Dr. Megan Hayes for Sweet Dreams Are Made of These, Strategies for Improving Your Sleep, where we'll find out why sleep is crucial for favorable long-term health outcomes. Then on Thursday, March 9th, join us for Preparing Your House Plants for Spring. In this webinar, owner and founder of Botanica Houseplant Shop, Caitlin Hastings, will show us how we can liven up our homes. On Tuesday, March 21st, parents will want to come back for, I believe there is a hero in all of us, superheroes and risk-taking behavior in young children. Dr. David Schwebel and, Schwebel and Cassie Morgan will take us through the risk factors for child injuries when exposed to superhero media. And on Tuesday, April 4th, Dr. Doug Mollering will show us how we can still eat healthy despite the hustle and bustle of daily life during healthy eating meets healthy activity for busy families. You can register for these and check out a bunch of other webinars, including that summer series on, on athletes, youth athletes and their parents at alumni.uab.edu slash events. I'd like to invite you to join us for our 17th annual scholarship run presented by Viva Health on Saturday, April 15th. Join us at the Battery in Homewood or virtually, wherever you are, as we raise money for student scholarships. We have a 5K and 10K option, as well as the opportunity to sleep in if you want through a virtual option. But as Dr. Natella said, we need to get off our butts. So early bird registration is only 30 bucks. Visit alumni.uab.edu slash 5K 10K. Finally, as promised, give us your feedback. Follow the QR code to let us know how we've done tonight and what topics you'd like to see covered during future webinars. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar. And as always, hey, go Greg. Blazers. Greg? Yes, Greg. sir. Also, can, can I personally thank everyone? It's very sure kind can. of everyone and uh, very kind. And I, I didn't realize it's 910. It is. It went by quick. <laughs> wow. Well, anyway, no, it's very kind of everyone who attended. Uh, uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And you're Mr. Barry, thank you. You're so welcome. And Greg, you take care. And I will keep this slide up for a little bit. Everybody else, have a great rest of your night. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.